Hi guys, so I am back. Uh, this is my report on day two of the trial, which was today, uh, Tuesday, November the 30th. So just to start off, before I say anything, because I don't want to forget, um, I've been getting a lot of crazy memes and like tweets about the judge and about uh, Comey, right? So Comey is the prosecutor and obviously you know her father. Okay, I don't, I, I can't speak to her father in this video. All I can tell you what I can speak to is her performance today. She was actually um, questioning her witness. She brought the pilot on that uh, was working with Jeffrey Epstein and knew um, Glenn Maxwell for 30 years, right? And that was her witness, witness for the prosecution. And she did a phenomenal job. She really went after him. And even though it was her witness, he was a hostile witness. And sorry, I think, I, okay. She really went after him and she did an amazing job. Uh, so far as the judge, the judge is beyond fair. There were two times that the defense objected. Um, however, there was no other way for Comey to ask her witness what she had to ask, right? First one was for the pilot. Second one was actually the uh, witness was Jane, was one of the accusers, which I was like, whoa, because I didn't expect her to come up or any of them to come up this early in the trial, right? So the defense objected once for the pilot, but literally there was no way to ask that question other than the way she was, she had to ask it. And the judge was super fair. You know, she called everyone to the bench. She's like, no, you know, go ahead, answer the question. She advised the jury and then he answered and fine, moving on. And then it happened again with um, Jane, which is the first accuser. Uh, that's not her name, it's an alias. But again, the defense objected to, I forgot the question right now, but the judge again was like, it's fine. And then she instructed the jury uh, how they should take that answer. And then she went ahead, Comey went ahead and asked the question and everything was cool. So I wish, this is why it's so important to have trials televised, right? Because when you actually see how people perform and actually see what happens, like we got to see that for the Kyle Rittenhouse um, trial. And I think that that made a huge difference and made a lot of people understand what the actual, what was actually happening as opposed to memes and tweets and all this other stuff. There's a lot of fake news out there. I will tell you, and I did tell you in my last video that I went the first day of the trial after Twitter all Sunday night and even Jack Prosaic, which is like I said, somebody that I follow and that, you know, I trust and that's fine. He got it wrong, but you know, he, his tweet was, you know, the judge isn't going to let anybody in. The judge doesn't want spectators. The judge isn't going to let um, the media in. And none of that was true. So I'm asking you guys, please, not to, I understand it's difficult in this situation because obviously you guys, you know, this is in New York, it's not being um, streamed. If you can't go, you can't go, I understand that. But try to under, try to take into consideration that it's possible that people are wrong. Maybe the memes are funny or maybe the tweets are really vicious or maybe there's a grain of truth because the judge worked with Obama or Comey because her dad, whatever, but none of that. I didn't see any weirdness today on Comey's part or the judge's part whatsoever. So rest assured things are going as good as they can be for the prosecution right now. So with that being said, now I'm gonna start. It was much easier today. The line was way shorter, just as predicted by my friends at Vanity Fair, who said tomorrow the line's gonna be super short, you're gonna see. it. You know, there was still like a little bit of a line, but it was much shorter and everything went ahead much smoother. We started, uh, the trial started promptly at, I think it was 9.40, I'll tell you right now. So I have better notes today. A lot of notes though, a lot. Um, I didn't wanna miss anything. I wanted to make sure that I caught enough stuff in case, because you don't know what somebody's gonna say. So you're, you're like, I wanna like catch it because if this is the one thing that's gonna, you know, uh, help the trial or help the case, help the prosecution, I wanna get it down. So. Yes, we started again, room 110, there were 27 people again. Um, 
and you guys are gonna have to find out the names. Comey was the first, she, she actually questioned her witness and it was the pilot, but you guys are gonna have to look up the names because the names were not provided. And then when the second um, witness came, Jane, there was a different person asking her questions from the prosecution side. Please do that homework. I'm really to like so thinned out on like time and energy. I'm trying my best, but if you guys could do that, that would be wonderful. And maybe just leave in the comments section down below the names of everybody so that we can all be on the same page. But I think his last name was V-I-K-O-S-K-I. -I. I think, Vikoski, I think so. Anyhow, so basically the way it started off was, um, Let's see. So basically, it, she went over everything with this pilot, right? Because he's somebody who would know, right? He was with them for 30 years. Um, so she, she just wanted to make sure that he was, she wanted to cement and, you know, finally just um, corroborate that he did know what he was talking about, right? So it was a lot of repetition and a lot of questions about minutia, which, it seemed like maybe it was too much, but I'm assuming that she's asking those questions for a good reason because later on, whatever else, I did not realize at this point that he was a hostile witness. That happened later. Okay, so she asked him like uh, about the personal assistance, about the hierarchy in um, where was Ghislaine in that hierarchy of employees since that's all she was, right? And he said she was number two. Quote, she handled mo most of the finance spending in the office. Quote, he had an array of personal assistants and buyers. So what he's saying is that he had so many properties, so many different um, branches and, and just like, just a lot of real estate that he had a lot of assistants. Okay, and but that Ghislaine was definitely number two right under, right beneath him. And then she asked, did Ghislaine have assistants? He said, yes, uh, some girl named Kimberly, I couldn't catch her last name, and another girl named Sarah. Sarah, there was some weirdness with Sarah, but we'll get to that. So she starts showing him pictures. Do you see, do you see these pictures? Yes, I do. Okay, you know, admit it into um, exhibit whatever numbers. And then it was Sarah when she was around 20 something years old, really beautiful. And then Sarah, when she looked like she was a kid, I, like a real kid, like 14 years old, maybe not even that. She didn't even look that old, but I'm assuming. And there was a picture of her with, um, so Jeffrey Epstein had her like hugged from behind and her head was like that and he was kissing her right here on the head. But it didn't look like like a fatherly kiss. It looked like a couple, but she was a child. And then, you know, we also got to see the other picture when she was a, a grown woman and apparently she kept on with uh, Ghislaine and with Epstein and she kept working for them after whatever weirdness happened there. I don't know. So that there was a lot of that a lot of pictures about of the um, real estate, right? So she asked him all the questions about all the different uh, aircraft that Epstein had, what years he had them. So he had a, a helicopter, obviously, and um, he had a, uh, I'm sorry, let me get this right. Let me get this absolutely right. What is it? Okay, so he had a Boeing 747, but that was later. And before that, he had a Gulfstream, but they called it a G2B, I think, or, yeah, the G2B. And what years, like, when did he get this one? When did he get rid of it? Like, real minutia, but again, like I said, I think she's asking it just to um, verify that this man absolutely knows what he's talking about. And he really did. So she asked him about all the different properties and he explained them right down to like, to like the nothingness and the ranch, which was called Zorro. Um, we saw pictures of that massive, like this guy lived really well. I mean, really, really well. Uh, buildings all over the ranch. I mean, like the, the main house was like a compound and that was, he still had other bigger properties on that land. It was 40,000 acres. And when was the house completed? And he, he knew exactly when. And where did Epstein stay before the house was completed? He had a triple wide, wide trailer on the ranch property that didn't look like a trailer at all, actually looked like a mansion, but you get the idea. Like she was asking him, where did you guys, what airports did you guys use to fly in and out of say the ranch? 
or um, Little St. Uh, James, right, the island. Like, what airports did you use when you went to Paris? What airports did you use when you'd go to New York? What did you use the aircraft for specifically? Why did you use the helicopter for? What was that used specifically for? Um, it was like a lot of minutia, right? Okay, so then, hold on. She asked them how often they visited Little St. J. Uh, how often they visited Paris, how often they visited all of the properties and why, and how did she know, or how did he know um, what everything looked like inside. And he said that he had put in the audio systems for all of Epstein's properties. So we're still talking about Epstein here, not really even a little bit of Ghislaine, only in the beginning when she asked, "Where's what's the hierarchy there? Then, um, okay, so the defense established that the witness was very familiar with each of Epstein's, not the defense, uh, the prosecution, right? Uh, established that the witness was familiar with uh, Ghislaine's, Ghislaine Maxwell's residences as well. Why? Because again, he had installed all of her uh, home studio uh, audio and all that in all of her residences. So she had three in Manhattan and within a time period, she um, upgraded, right? And so. Uh, Comey asked him exactly when did she upgrade and how did he know that and why did he know that and on and on, right? So then, okay, so then I guess the last place she had was a brownstone, like a, a five-story building, which sounded absolutely gorgeous um, and whatever. And then he, he talks about all of that, the aircraft again, when it was owned, the dates when they were bought or sold, uh, the Boeing 7... 727, sorry, the Gulfstream until 2004, and then he got the Boeing. How many helicopters? Just one, 1999 or 2000. That's when he got it. When's the helicopter used for? To get from St. Thomas to, um, from St. Thomas, the airport, to uh, Little St. James, right? So for him, for Ghislaine, for, you know, who would who would actually be on this, just them and whoever was the contract pilot, sometimes they use them, but not often. So Ghislaine herself flew it many times as she knew how to pilot the helicopter. She flew it many times, fine. Okay, so they showed us pictures about all that. Sorry, I just wanna get, um... okay, so each apartment. Okay, so the Boeing was humongous and the uh so Comey asked him like what how was the door to the pilots uh to the cabin closed or open he said it was always usually closed no matter what aircraft they were on but that on the boeing each section of the boeing had its own door so regardless he couldn't hear anything if the cabin his cabin door was closed which it almost always was but he said, and he made a point of saying that Epstein had told him that they were free to use the bathroom. Um, for example, if they were on the, I think it was on the, on the jet, the bathroom was like toward the back of the jet. So he would have, so the pilots would have had to walk through the quarters where people, you know, the sofas and whatever else to get to the bathroom. But he was told like that he could, like that they were free to roam, to go to the bathroom and do whatever they needed to do without any worry about privacy or anything else. So he made a point about saying that. So she asked him if Epstein would, like how did the logs happen, right? So the log and the manifest, like what was the difference? So he said the log is basically like, how many um how many hours flight hours you know when it lands when it takes off all of that the rotations on the equipment obviously because it, it has to get replaced right that's the log and then the manifest is all about the passengers right so it's just about like times dates and names of passengers how many people are on the aircraft right so then he so she asked him who completed the manifest. He said, whoever was the captain, who, what is the captain, whoever is actually flying the aircraft, when are these um, manifests made? And he said immediately after landing. And then after 30 days, he said he would drop them off in the New York office. To who was not to Ghislaine. It was to some guy named, I think, Gary, right? So I guess his point this I still didn't realize he was hostile. It was later. At this point, he is still kind of trying to say like, oh, like he's putting in whatever he can 
to kind of distance Ghislaine from knowing what, who flew when and where. Like, she has no idea. She has no um, control over that. She can't, like, uh, change it or whatever because she doesn't get them. Some guy named Gary in the New York office gets them after 30 days, and that's it. So he made a point of that. I took notice of that, but what he said later was way, way worse. All right, so um, she said, would Epstein always introduce the guests? What if you didn't know the guest's name? He'd say, oh, we just write down, like, woman. You know, more or less, it's all about weight. But and then they were cracking a lot of jokes, which I didn't get. He was like, well, it's, you know, I can't just ask them how much they weigh, whatever. Um, and everybody laughed, kind of. Well, Comey didn't laugh. She didn't think it was funny. But um, so then... She asked him about Travis City, Michigan, right? And she asked him about the School of Music. I think it's called Interlochen, something like that. And how did did she know that Epstein had had gone there? Had he ever picked him up there? Yes. Um, how many kids do you recall Epstein was with from this school? He said one. And then she goes ahead and she shows uh, the exhibits. Now these exhibits are sealed, meaning that a lot of what she said, it's just, it's just redacted. Nobody can actually hear anything. It was the birth certificates of said child. And then he gets to see it, but he can't speak on it. And the jury gets to see it, but only that one page, they can't like flip around. They have like a a book like this and then they're instructed to only look at certain pages at certain times when they are told to so they go to this page and then she asks them okay exhibits do you see this and she goes through all the exhibits yes is that the child that you saw yes okay so then like i said there were a lot of jokes and then the judge because the judge was like okay um she was instructing the jury please do not look through the rest of the thing she was giving them like all this instruction she's like and there's a surprise beneath your your chair like just as a joke because i guess it was just like so many rules um glenn looked alert but she looked bored she looked like she was bored with this whole process like she couldn't care less basically so okay so they so then comey goes ahead and she verifies that the child from this school of music was a singer the pilot says yes i believe so whatever right so she asked him did anyone ever tell you how old jane was he answered no she says how did you meet jane he said mr epstein brought her to the cockpit and then comey says describe her and this is when i knew he was hostile he said she was a mature woman with piercing blue eyes. First of all, nobody asked you if she was a mature or immature or tall or nothing. Like, describe her is usually like, oh, you know, brunette, five, five, like something like this. Mature is kind of like, that's when I was like, okay, this adjective does not belong here. And he's making like a point of like, I'm not going along with you. Like, I'm here, I'm your witness and I don't want to be here, but at, then it got me thinking, like, what was it? Like, was he trying to distance himself from the any cul culpability? Like, are there maybe charges against him if this it does turn the way that maybe the prosecution wants it to? Or, or, you know, is he afraid of that? Or is it just that he's still team Epstein or what is it? Right. But I was just like, and we all kind of looked at each other in the room like, okay, that wasn't called for. Mature woman with piercing blue eyes. All right, fine. When they were departing um, West Palm Beach Airport. And then she also asked him, did you meet Virginia Roberts? He said yes in the mid-late 90s. I don't know who Virginia Roberts is at this point. So I'm like, okay, did anyone ever tell you how old Virginia was? He answered no. How many times did you see her? I don't know. Definitely more than one and then he said yes okay so here comes the defense the defense the defense okay it was like the defense was trying to play jedi mind tricks i'm not even kidding you and i'm sitting there like can you stop because he would for example i'm gonna go through it but he would for example say like 
Okay, sir. Uh, let's just call him John. Okay, John. So you ate Taco Bell on Monday. Yes. And you had what? A chalupa. Okay. And then Tuesday you went somewhere else, right? You went to the pet shop, right? He says, yes. And what was your relationship with the dog at the pet shop? Did you know the, the pet shop owner? And did you do all this? Okay. So now let's switch to like 1994. So now we're going like all over the place, not linear at all. He's jumping all over the place. And then he goes back to Okay, so then how was that chalupa? Let's go through that again. And it's all like some really confusing, like a fog, right? And I'm watching this and I'm like, can you stop? Because I am, I know what he's doing and I'm falling asleep because it's, he's doing it on purpose to make it hard to follow, to make it hard to understand why any of this matters. And you hear the same thing two, three times, but it's not linear. You don't understand what's the point. He said a lot of things that were fluff that just didn't matter. I'm gonna go through them. All right, so he asked him when he was hired, uh, 1991. Yes, Dave Rogers was the co-pilot. They were both hired at the same time. Dave used to be the captain and uh, this gentleman was the co-pilot and then it changed. Uh, and they changed positions. They didn't, or, or uh, yeah, positions. There's nothing else to call it. Um, I just don't want to say anything, you know. Um, and he didn't say why. I just they changed positions. All right. So didn't fly Hopper after '94. No, it was sold. G2B in 1994. Correct. Boeing in 2000. Um, how many flights? It was like a lot of stuff. And then he asked him, "Have you ever seen a young girl traveling on the plane with Epstein without an adult?" And the pilot said, no. Did any women that were on the flights appear to be under the age of 20? He said, no. And then the defense asked him, what about Jane? And quote, the pilot said, quote, she looked like a woman. And then the defense said, a mature woman? And he said, yes. So obviously, right, right, I got it the first time, but that just like cemented it. And then in reference to this Virginia person, he said, the pilot said, she looked young, but she was a woman. He just kept hammering that in. Like, he just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that in his eyes, these were all women. These were all grown, mature women, right? And then the pilot was talking on and on. And it, one of the things he said, and this is a direct quote, I never saw any sexual activity, meaning on the flights, right? So... Again, witness testified that the pilots were welcome and free to use the bathrooms at the back of the uh, of the um, jet. Feel free to use the bathroom is what Epstein said. So there was no privacy issues there. Uh, so then the defense got really like just unprofessional. So he was like, OK, so you never saw sex toys. So you never saw used condoms laying around. And the pilot just answered him like, that's correct. It, the, it's just like he was leading him and the pilot was going along with it. In my opinion, he was never, he was always team Epstein and the defense already knew that. And they were just like playing off of each other and it was very annoying. So yes, that's what I said. Uh, he still, he seemed very much team Epstein or trying to distance himself from culpability and that the prosecution only called him in order to establish that he, that he saw said Jane and Virginia with Epstein on flights and that he knew exactly the layout of every place. Okay, so he said that Sarah would also schedule flights. So, you know, anybody, uh, either Ghislaine or Epstein or Sarah could schedule a flight. It wasn't just one person. Uh, and then the defense said, oh, around the time she became Epstein's assistant. And then the pilot said, well, I, I don't know what her role was, but she was an employee. Yes, okay. And again, more jokes. I didn't write them down because I got tired of it. Um, okay, very interesting. So this is when the defense started. He brought up Bill Clinton straight away, right? But it was so like off brand. It was, there was no reason to bring up Bill Clinton, but he just like threw him in there, right? And uh, he was just saying like, oh, there were many important people on these flights, right? And then he threw it in there and, and President Bill Clinton had flown on the aircraft, correct? And so he reiterated everything that the witness had already attested to the prosecution all over again for no reason other than to confuse the jury and I guess mentally wear them out, right? And what else? Friends, if, okay, so then uh, the, uh, the defense says, well, but other people were on there as well. It was also friends and family of Epstein. It wasn't just like 
in these important people or these women and you would t uh, label them tagalongs if you didn't if it was not a common flyer he said correct and then oh the guy's name was warren he said manifests were sent to warren in uh the main new york city office and that was the main thing like he said it once and then now he's saying it again like over and over it was very challenging mentally right and so he, so then that was not enough for the defense so he just hammered it in not to galane he answered no so she wouldn't know what passengers were on the flights and that um unless she was on it correct yes that's right okay so then they talked about the school inter interlocking i think that's what it's called the michigan school and it's like for kids that are very bright in the arts and whatever and that's where jane who is not her real name went and that's where jane met uh galane and epstein and he just it, it was just more of that just more of that going on and on so that's what i got from the first wit uh, witness, which was the pilot, that he was a hostile witness, that yes, he knew all the layouts, he had been with them for 30 years, um, that he wanted to distance himself as much as possible from any culpability, and that he seemed to be still very much Team Epstein. And I kind of understand that because he was with them for 30 years, and I'm assuming he made really great money. And also, um, you'll see, like, uh, Epstein was very generous with this man's daughters. Uh, they were young when, I think in 1994, one of his daughters was 14 at that time. And Epstein was very generous with all of his employees' children. He paid for their educations. He did all this stuff. So I understand to a point how that man can be in a situation where he doesn't want to uh, make it seem like he was part of something horrible. Obviously, he doesn't want to go to prison. And also, I think there's maybe a part of his mind that he wants to remember things a certain way because he did better benefit from it okay so then jane came on right and like i said i was shocked i didn't expect her to come on so early i thought it was something maybe day five or so because there's six weeks uh, the trial scheduled for six weeks but no she came in today so um oh <laughs> sorry before jane came in the defense said to the pilot, remember that she had large breasts. Remember that you said she had large breasts. And the pilot said, well, she seemed to me to be a mature woman. Nobody said large breasts. Nobody said that. So I don't understand like what that what that was about. It was just kind of lurid. He said a lot of stuff that was unnecessary. Um, okay. I want to get to the Jane part already because I already told you, I think. Oh, he asked about Annie Farmer. I'm sorry, what I meant to tell you about the defense, okay? What I wrote here is what does any of this have to do with Ghislaine? Because he kept on saying just uh, nonsense that didn't have anything to do with this trial. Or I couldn't see any reason that it was being brought up because it didn't have any sort of like anything that I could say like, oh, I see where he's going with this. He's, you know, trying to verify stuff for the future. I, there was like no point. It was either things that the pilot had already said or things that just didn't, you know, weren't gonna, I, I, I can see at this point, right? Um, okay, well, so the defense starts dropping names. When he dropped Bill Clinton, he dropped a lot of names, like a lot of them, like all at once. And I took that to mean that the defense was trying to play a tactic where if he mentions the powerful men's names first, then it takes power away from the prosecution when the prosecution says that if the prosecution is the first one to introduce, I don't know that she would have, but let's just say, if she were going to introduce the name of a, of a powerful man that was involved in all this, it would have more power if it's the first time that people are hearing it, first time that the jury is hearing it. But if the defense already said it, then it's kind of like, oh, you know, it's, it's easier to, to accept when you've heard that before right and we all know this from advertising you hear something seven times you understand it you accept it look what happened with other things that's been going on since last year at first everybody's like hey so i think that that's why he did that he just wanted to name all the powerful people he mentioned prince andrew he mentioned um bill gates he mentioned uh trump he mentioned uh oh, I didn't write it down because there were so many. And it's just people that you know in the news, but he mentioned them first. So he made a point of doing that, which I thought was really smart of him to do because I would have done the same thing. Um, but the narrative thread, it was all over the place. I'm telling you, he was. it was like, 
it, it was so annoying, but I can't even un, un, imagine how the jury was feeling because they must have been like so bombarded with so much information that was useless. You know, it was like useless information just taking up because they probably don't know like what should I listen to, what's going to be important. And when this man's just talking so much nonsense, that I, I think that's what he was trying to do, like fill up their RAM, right? Okay, so knowing that the next one, the next witness was going to be Jane. So... Epstein had given, so he asked the pilot, uh, Epstein had given you 40 acres of land to build a house without charging you, is that correct? And the man said, yes, that's correct. And see, the, he goes from that question to reiterating which airports they used and for what locations. This is the type of stuff that he was doing. Like he'd ask a valid question and then follow it up with a bunch of questions that were either already asked or just that didn't matter, didn't make any sense. Um, let me see. Okay. Um, back to the acreage. Okay. And he said the Epstein had paid for his daughter's tuition and for college. So their high school uh, tuition and their college tuition for both his daughters. And he said, yes. And then he said, did you ask him to do that? He said, no. Uh, had he done this for all of his employees? for all his employees children he said yes so i guess he tried to, the defense was trying to establish epstein as a patron and a selfless person but again epstein is not on trial this is what the defense has done from opening day like made this all about epstein and very little to do with Ghislaine, if at all if at all so they're just concentrating on making epstein seemed like a good person, that he had back problems, yes. Did you know that he got professional massages? Yes, he went to some place called 10,000 Waterfalls, which sounds ridiculous, but apparently it's a nice place. Um, and then, yeah, I just wanna be done with this because it was just reiterating a lot of, a lot of crap. Okay, so, oh wait, and then he said, oh, I don't even wanna go into this. He, he talked about Ava Dugan, which was, um, Epstein's former girlfriend, I guess. She was also former Miss Sweden. Yes, he, he knew that, he knew her. Uh, and then he tried to establish like when Ghislaine was, like when she and Epstein stopped uh, having a romantic relationship, right? So then he says, she, but she was still an employee after the romance with Epstein was over. He said, yes, her role in his life was decreasing, correct? So that was a leading question. And I didn't understand why, there were a lot of leading questions from the prosecution and I didn't, the pro, um, from the defense and the prosecution didn't say anything, which to me, I was like, get them, but whatever. But she did after. So then, um, correct. So her role in his life was decreasing, correct? Yes. So it was all business, yes. Uh, and then he asked about, I don't know, some, some guy named Wade. Okay, then we broke for lunch. After we come back from lunch, the defense is still with the same witness, the pilot, right? Now he's going into that Ghislaine took helicopter classes. How long were these classes? How many days? How many hours? Where? What were their locations? Like trying to establish that she was way too busy, way too busy to be doing anything else on tour. She was too busy getting her license for her to even think about picking up girls or getting girls for, um, what's his name? None of that, right? So he goes into the whole minutia of that. And then he asks, uh, the pilot ever have you ever seen her do or say anything that made you think that she had done what she's accused of pilot said no and he talked again about the witnesses two daughters and he asked him if Ghislaine Maxwell had spent time with his daughters etc and the pilot said that's correct and implying that he's she he trusted her obviously and then he asked him if you had an inkling that either Ghislaine Maxwell or Jeffrey Epstein were involved in accusations. And he was just like, I would never, no, my kids would have never been around them. Okay, that was the end of that. Now the prosecution comes in, Comey comes back, and she, like, it was like a machine gun, right? So the first question she asked him was, when your daughter was 14 years old, did you let her, your daughter massage Jeffrey Epstein? He said no. Uh, 
who did you meet first, Jane? Because then there was a point where the pilot was trying to say that there were two people, two women with the name Jane. And that if you look at the manifest, just because it says Jane, it doesn't mean it's one or the other. It could be either one and it was so long ago and he can't remember and suddenly, you know, whatever else, fine. But so she was asking him, who did you meet first? And who did you meet second? She wanted to cement, obviously, that Jane, the victim, was the one that he had met first because she was younger and that he, sh he should have known that. Something in his head should have known that. So Jane, the victim, was met in 1994, and the other Jane was met in the 2000s, so she wanted to verify that. And then she just went after him. She was like, did you ever pick Jane up at high school? He said, no. Did you ever meet Jane's mother? He said, no. Did you ever ask Jane about camp? No. Something like all of this, I'm, I'm thinking, right, it's going to come out that he actually did all this stuff and that the witness is gonna attest to this. But she was going at him like rapidly. And I was like, oh, thank God, you know, let's put an end to this. She was like really aggressive with him. And he was kind of like, like just no, 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 like that. And okay, so now 155 Jane comes in. So now Comey sits down and it's the other uh, woman from the prosecution, another young woman, I don't know her name. It's not the woman from yesterday, it's another one. So 155 Jane comes in and when she comes in, when she's announced that, you know, she's going to come in and whatever else, Ghislaine looks toward the door and she's like waiting, waiting to see. Right. And she's like, when Jane walks in, Ghislaine is just like staring her down, like, like laser staring her down. Right. The woman's very beautiful. I, I, she's very beautiful. She's not what I expected. She has long brown hair, like down to here. She was wearing a black turtleneck and a black skirt with black tights and black heels and like a gray, like loose sweater. And she had her hair back like this on both sides and parted to the side. And she was looked very chic and very like worldly. And so the witness faced the room with a confident, open expression and voice. She did. She didn't look like you know, she was wavering or whatever. She, she sat there like, this is it. She gave such a great testimony. I mean, it was, I believed it a hundred percent. So, okay. She confirmed that the birth certificate they had, they had spoken about earlier was hers. When did you meet Epstein? 1994. How old were you? 14. Once or more, uh, who was in the room with you whenever you had sex with Epstein? She said, Ghislaine Maxwell, and she pointed to her and she had to describe her. And so they wrote that down. So, and she lived in Palm Beach, Florida, 1993. She was 12 to 13 years old. And she had, um, her father had died. Her dad was a composer and her dad had died of cancer. I think of leukemia and the family lost everything. Right. And then they had to move out of their home. They lost everything. And she had, she has two brothers and they were both, um, musically inclined, just like she was. And then her older sister, she ended up going to that camp where she met Glane and Epstein. She and her two brothers because her older sister paid for them to go. And she had just finished seventh grade. And so she talks about the time that she met them. She said that Jane said that she was at the park with her friends eating ice cream, just like whatever, hanging out between classes of the camp. And Ghislaine came by walking a little Yorkie and then all her friends were like, oh, can we pet him, whatever. And then her friends left for class and then Ghislaine stayed and then Epstein joined them. She said Epstein was very interested in my experience at the camp, said they um, gave scholarships, etc. asked for Jane's, Jane, Jane's mom's name and number. At the time, well, she was a little kid, so she gave him, like she didn't know, she just gave her mom's name and number. At the time, she said that they were living in a pool house because uh, they had lost everything. So she slept in a bed with her mom and her brothers were on another bed. So it was rough and she felt intimidated and she just told them, right? So she goes into eighth grade when Epstein and Ghislaine call her mom and invited her and her mom to go to his house for tea. He, like, who does that? Uh, chauffeur picked them up. And it was all very fancy and they were all very intimidated. And then he starts talking to the mother. They go into his office. She said it was humongous. And he said, you know, I like to mentor students. Um, 
and she asked who and um the prosecutor asked who was in the house when you spent time with him at his house she's like Lane Maxwell then she, she said that she thought they were married or that they were best friends and she couldn't figure it out she's a kid she doesn't know what's going on and after that Ghislaine or Epstein's other assistant would call and would call for her for Jane to go to his house and she would go without her mother now this to me was like a massive red flag like how and then the prosecutor said why would you go without your mother and she said because she wasn't invited in what universe does a woman allow her 14 year old kid to go to the house of a very wealthy person of a couple whether they're together or not why would you let your kid go by by herself she's a little kid and the mother had no had nothing to like she just let her go like it was like nothing and then later on we find out why um so she said that one time something did happen she walked in and Ghislaine and four other women were at the pool and they were either naked or topless and she said she was shocked but she she asked, well I asked myself why would she go back but I, I I guess it was like she was very young she said she saw Ghislaine as an older sister and that maybe Ghislaine knew best or whatever um a few visits he gifted her cash to give her to her mom right so one time he gave her cash right before she left and she said no and he said no give it to your mom I know you guys are having a hard time just give it to your mom and after that it was every time she went to visit which she would go to visit every week or every 10 days and she he paid for her voice lessons her clothes things for her school um Ghislaine talked to her about boyfriends they went shopping uh Victoria's Secret but she just bought her like kids underwear but you know she told her oh you know we know the guy who owns this they're always name dropping they talked about the men that that they knew she says that she named Donald Trump Bill Clinton and Mike Wallace which I thought was very weird uh where's the first time that you had sex Palm Beach house and he said to her quote I can make things happen but you got to be ready for it and then he she said that every, the conversation ended abruptly and he he just grabbed her by the hand and said follow me and she said that this was typically how he would start all these like sex things like he would just command the room like oh let's let's go follow me and they'd go into whatever room it was that they were doing this so I don't want to get into this because there's no reason but he pleasured himself and then she didn't know what to, she says she had never seen anything like that she didn't tell anybody she freaked and she just froze and she felt very ashamed but she continued to see him yes um did you ever see Ghislaine without her clothes on yes when shortly after the first time with Epstein I guess that was the whatever the breaking but I got to tell you guys this was very believable there were times when this woman was giving her testimony and she was crying but you couldn't tell from her voice her voice was very like she commanded it and the tears you know she would just keep going like this but she didn't waver at all um in her in her like she wasn't melodram melodramatic at all she was crying but it was like she couldn't stop it you know what I mean but she wasn't she wasn't using it to try to get the jury on her side or anything like that uh, they talked about the massages she said that he liked it very hard on his head on his hands on his feet he just did a bunch of like stupid crap um, and that Glenn made it seem very casual like it wasn't a big deal which confused and embarrassed her because she's a kid the thing is she asked her where did she touch you and all that what house where'd you guys go like all of this um, then she said that at Epstein's houses, any which house, right? It would either be her, Ghislaine, and Epstein, or her, Ghislaine, and a group of women. She never said it was a group of men or anything like that. It was always a group of women. When did this start? Well, this started shortly after that. And then he would just, again, take somebody by the hand and say, follow me, and they'd all go into this room, and then all this stuff would happen, right? And it would turn into an orgy, that's what she said and she talked about what were the sex acts whatever the other people in the room what what was their gender she said female she was crying at this point but again she her voice was very direct um so from the age of 14 to 16 this happened every two weeks 
at least every two weeks. So my question was, where was her mother? Like, how is this even possible? How, how she said, Jane said that she had traveled with them one time and she had to get back because she had to go to school, but she was only 15. She didn't have an ID. She didn't have a license even to get on the plane and that Ghislaine uh, made accommodations for her to be able to get back home. But how do you not know where your daughter is? She's 15, she has school and you don't know where your kid is and you know she's with these people, but you don't know where or you're not even concerned. From what I understand, it was a situation where the mother um, was always had been like, I guess like a manic depressive and feelings weren't talked about in the house. No expression of feelings, none of that. You um, deal with it some other way. So when her father died, she felt like she couldn't even grieve her father and there was no one to talk to. She didn't have that relationship with her mother. So when all of these things were happening to her, she didn't have anybody to talk to. The prosecutor did, um, yeah, the prosecutor did ask her like, why didn't you talk to one of your siblings? And she said, the direct quote, it was really sad. She said, how do you explain this to one of your peers or to one of your siblings? Like, how do you explain this? And it was just super sad. There was a lot of stuff going on. Um, she said that she was flat chested until she was 16, that there was nothing womanly about her whatsoever. Um, and yeah, that her mom didn't allow her to grieve. Her mom didn't allow her any expression. Um, so this was a direct quote. My mom was so enamored with the idea that these wealthy people had taken an interest in me. And then the prosecutor said, did your mother ever talk about Ghislaine or Jeffrey? And she said, yes. And what would she say? And there's another direct quote that I needed to be grateful. And then we had a break. But she was very earnest. Like, I believed her. I believed her 100%. Um, there was nothing in her demeanor that made me feel like she was lying or that this was a ploy or whatever. Right. And then it goes on after that. They talk about, like, the situation with her mom, uh, more timeline with her and Epstein and the group situations and how many, I don't know, more than twice. Um, she showed a headshot that she, uh, Jane had, a, a headshot of Jane that she had signed for him once she was already like 19. And she said, thanks for making my, thanks for rocking my world. And she said, what does that mean? She said, I was a kid. That was the slang. You know, I was trying to be cool. I didn't know what else to write. So I wrote that. Um, how has the abuse affected you? And a direct quote that she said is, how do you navigate a relationship with a broken compass? So she when she was 17, she moved out of Florida and moved to New York City, of course, to go to the professional children's school her senior year who paid for that, Jeffrey Epstein. Of course, he had her right there. And did you continue the massages with him? Yes. Did you want to? No. Um, and then in 1999, she moved to LA for a TV show and she's a working actor. Now I know what you're going to say. She's a working actor. You can't trust her. That is absolutely not how I felt about this at all. I've known many actors in my life. I have worked with actors. I've been an actor. I've directed actors. I've, I've auditioned actors. I like, I know actors. This was not an act. This woman was the real thing. Like it was very, very compelling. And if I were on that jury, even if I would have had a doubt before that would have erased it for me right there. So she said that in 2002, she stopped contacting Epstein because she got engaged and so she ignored him. He got enraged. He started, you know, calling her incessantly, like, don't forget what I did for you. Remember what I did for you. And just like bringing up all that stuff. Um, but finally that ended. And then in 2007, she had a boyfriend named Matt. This was the first guy she ever told about the abuse because this is when Epstein had been arrested and he was always in the news and she got very emotional and he was noticing. And that's when she told him like what had actually happened to her. And so what happened? So Jane sued Ghislaine in early 2020, okay, last year, after she had talked to the government in 2019 about Jeffrey Epstein, when all that stuff came out, I guess the government had gone and asked her like about Epstein and her experience with him and she had given them all a full interview. After that, she sued Ghislaine Maxwell. And then the prosecutor said, did you sue the estate of Epstein with a pseudonym, um, a pseudonym like a false name to protect your identity. Yes. She said, how much did the fund award you? $5 million. The Jeff Jeffrey Epstein fund awarded uh, this woman, Jane, $5 million. 
the prosecution said, did you receive it in full? She said, no, I got 2.9. Uh, to be awarded, the prosecutor says, uh, the prosecutor says to be awarded the $5 million, did you have to drop the suit against both Epstein and Ghislaine? Yes. So I did. So basically meaning I got the 5 million and I dropped my lawsuit. So then of course the prosecutor asked the most normal question is, so the jury's, de the jury's decision won't affect your objection, your honor, right there, right? So clearly this woman is not doing it for the money. She already got her money. She's gonna get the rest of it. She already, like whatever money she's gonna get, it, that's it, it's a wrap. She can't do anything else. And basically the reason that she's doing this is just to get, I guess, some closure and some justice and have Ghislaine Maxwell pay for what she's done. I think that it was a super compelling um, argument, uh, like testimony. I think that the prosecution, did, the prosecutor did a good job of questioning her. Personally, I wish Comey had done it because I think she would have been better because um, she was really good uh, earlier in the day. And there was a time when she actually slipped a note to the prosecutor that was questioning Jane. And then the next question obviously comes from that note, which was an excellent question, which for some reason, this prosecutor was all into the facts, but she never asked her how she felt. And it, that was the question, like, how did this make you feel? And at that point, like, the testimony was just so different. It was a totally different thing because then she could actually talk about like the effects of all this when she was a kid. And in my opinion, and maybe I'm wrong and God forgive me, her mother knew, her mother had to know because Epstein put them in this huge house, her, her sons, her daughter, he paid for her daughter's schooling, he paid for all their expenses while her daughter was going to this prestigious school. And it's just doesn't make any sense any other way. How do you have a child this young and not know where that child is or that it's okay for your child, your your female child, any female or male, it doesn't even matter, to go to the house of a millionaire or a billionaire or anybody that you don't even know them, right? And on top of that, they're a couple, and you know what couples do, like this is just all, very, to me, her mother had to have known on some level. She had to have known. And this was the implicit pact that these adults had. I didn't doubt her for a second. So, and seeing now that she obviously, she, but even before I heard that, like I believed her, but like the icing on the cake was the fact that she wasn't gonna get any money from this. So she was just there for that. So that being said, we shall see what happens tomorrow, day three. I will be there once again. Thank you guys so much. If you have any questions, please type them down below. Let me know what your questions are. I'll try my best to answer them if I know. If I don't know, I'll try my best to find out because remember, I am there. There are many journalists there that have are very nice to me and we talk and if there's anything that you guys want to know I can try to find out but again I want to remind you don't believe everything that you read on Twitter and these memes and all this like Comey's this and her father that and the judge and Obama it, that none of that mattered from what I saw today it was all fair and square and so it's going well in my opinion and like I said the opening statements yesterday the way the defense is going at this trying to make uh, Epstein into a good guy this is a really stupid move. I told my mom about that and she said, I think they're gonna go for a mistrial. And there's a part of me that's like, she's probably right. I don't know how this is gonna play out, but I will let you guys know. So tomorrow I'm gonna upload this now. I need to go to sleep. And then tomorrow, hopefully everything's gonna be moving right along. So I love you guys. Thank you so much and I'll see you soon.